Rust can run in quite a few environments, from small embedded systems to massively scalable serverless platforms. Where you deploy your application then depends on a few factors. In this video, we'll look at what platforms are available, choose one that fits our use case, and then go through the process of deploying a JSON API in Rust to that platform. This video is part of a series to see if Rust and Wasm are ready for prime time. Here are a bunch of platforms that you could use to deploy a Rust application. But if we start off by thinking about what we're actually trying to deploy, it's pretty easy to remove a couple of these options from the list. For example, we're not gonna deploy a web-based JSON API to a microcontroller, so we can cross that off the list right away. Slightly less obvious is the sort of bigger cousin to embedded systems, and that's bare metal. And this is where we get into the project's priorities. Specifically, as we covered in the video choosing a database, time spent managing infrastructure is time taken away from providing value to learners. This easily knocks bare metal platforms like Hetzner off the list because it's just too much work to set up and maintain that infrastructure for what we're trying to do. I'm also gonna knock off the individual compute instances from AWS, GCP, and Azure for much the same reason. It's just not the level I want to be working at. I don't wanna be managing instances. I wanna be pushing more workshops to this site. And finally, one shout out for Kubernetes because who doesn't love to talk about Kubernetes? I've run Kubernetes before and I have no desire to do so again. I also don't think the complexity that comes with using a hosted Kubernetes cluster is worth the squeeze for this project. So hosted versions like GKE are out. This brings us down to two major categories, the Heroku alikes, and the serverless functions. There are quite a few serverless platforms out there, but we can still take a quick broad stroke to eliminate a lot of them. Firstly, some of these platforms that have edge functions, however they define that for themselves, require you to compile your Rust to Wasm to actually deploy it. There are additional complexities when compiling to Wasm and none of the features that we would get out of doing that really benefit this project, so that's off the table. Then there are the unsupported runtimes. Vercel, for example, claims to have a Rust runtime, but it hasn't been updated in a few years and the dependencies are really out of date, which leaves us with some of the bigger platforms like AWS Lambda or the platforms that are built on top of them like Netlify Functions. Now, if we look at AWS, there is a well-supported runtime that is well-maintained by a group of people, as well as some interesting ecosystem tooling in Cargo Lambda, which helps you deploy those lambdas to AWS. So I think AWS, or at least solutions like it, are one of the best solutions for deploying serverless functions. However, I don't think this project benefits from serverless as we've already chosen Axum to build out our application. And if we were going to take a serverless approach, I would have already used the Lambda runtime and Lambda HTTP crates to build out that solution. So we have a Rust binary that we wanna ship as a Rust binary. We don't wanna manage individual instances and we don't wanna compile it to Wasm to have to deploy it. What we're left with is the Heroku alikes. Heroku pioneered a pretty popular methodology for building and deploying applications quite a while ago. And the companies that have picked up the modern trail typically do so on the back of Docker with things like Docker files. I have way more confidence in my Rust servers running without issue compared to the Node.js servers that I've run in the past with things like tracing and data collection, et cetera. So I decided to go with the fly.io, Firecracker, and Docker-based approach. I gained my own Docker skills from working there quite a while ago, so while I don't want to run Kubernetes or operate it, I'm pretty comfortable building a slim container that will work for this project. Fly is an application host much like Heroku, with the big difference being that Fly is based on a technology called Firecracker. This is the same micro VM technology that AWS Lambda uses to power AWS Lambda. This means you could use Fly to build your own functions offering running untrusted user code, much like any of these other platforms. Firecracker is a Rust project for building small, quick to boot micro VMs, but Fly has you define your environment as a Docker file anyway. This gives you the advantage of working with well-documented, widely used technology like the Docker file syntax, but also gives you a Firecracker micro VM out the other end. Micro VMs aren't central to this prototype, but they are for some other work I'm doing. That's spoilers though. Fly also offers an internal networking solution based on IPv6 and WireGuard, which is the same technology that Tailscale uses for their VPN, which I'm also a customer of. This will be most interesting when we start to deploy our UI service, which can then talk to our API service on the private network. Fly also has database hosting, but I'm not using it because I want to use PlanetScale's Git branching features and Fly's Postgres offering actually isn't a managed database. So that means we need to get this Rust application into that Docker container so we can ship it to Fly 
as a Firecracker Micro VM. It would be super easy to just Docker pull Rust and do whatever we need to inside of that container image. But uh, that image includes a lot of development tooling that we don't need. Specifically, we don't need it in production. So we could go for something super slim with muscle libc, maybe Alpine, or we could go with something like a slim Debian build. I've spent some time working around Alpine and muscle libc builds, and I'd like to avoid doing that for now. So let's go check out what the image sizes are for the other options. The latest tag starts at 500 megabytes and the slim tag starts at around 200. So let's just take one of those for the build image and we'll use a different Debian slim image for actually shipping the production image. Due to the way that this Docker file stuff works, we can always just swap out the image later. I typically don't actually have Docker running on my local machine anymore these days, unless I really need it for something. So it's really nice that Fly will take my Docker file as well as my code and go build it on Fly. And I want this server to be as close to my other infrastructure as possible. So here we come, Secaucus, New Jersey. <laughs> Fly writes out a fly.toml file that I want to check before we actually deploy, so I'll skip the auto deploy for now. We also need to set up the database credentials as secrets and change out the socket adder that we talked about in the last video for what I'll call anytime, anywhere, just give me a call so that it works for IPv4 and IPv6. I'll expose this service to the internet for now just to make it easy for myself, but we could also make this private if we only want the UI layer to contact it later on. We also have the ability to access it through the WireGuard network, so we could just leave this as private if we wanted to. It occurs to me, of course, as I see the context sending all the way up to fly.io's Docker implementation that I forgot to implement a Docker ignore and not send the target directory. So let's take a break to do that. We also need to expose our database secrets to the Docker build, which we can do via mounts in the Docker file and passing the secret along the CLI when we do our build. Don't forget to obscure this if you <clears throat> make videos <laughs> because it'll sit in your terminal history unless you're pulling it from your one password. And ta-da, we have a running Rust API on fly.io backed by Axum and PlanetScale. In the next video, we'll start working on the UI. So stick around for those choices and have a great rest of your day.